for everyone coming in. Welcome to our panel. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm just gonna wait a few more minutes. Looks like we got a bunch of people joining. Very exciting. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Women in the World panel. We'll kick things off in about another minute or two while we wait for folks to join. All right, so I think we are good to start. So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for our Women in the World panel. I'm Emily Witherell, and I'm a member of Tufts Women in International Relations. This panel is co-hosted by the Tufts branch of Women's Higher Education Now and Women in IR. So first and foremost, we would like to extend a warm welcome to all of our panelists, Agnieszka Felducha Santos, Anna Larson, Deborah Schildekraut, and Gila Yoon. Thank you for being here to talk with us today. And just a few housekeeping things. The chat is disabled, so please direct all your questions to the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end. Also, please note that this webinar is being recorded in case you'd like to go back and reference it later. We're going to start with a land recognition and then I'll introduce the moderators and we'll move into a moderated Q&A followed by an audience Q&A at the conclusion of the panel. Even though we are on Zoom, we'd like to recognize the indigenous sovereignty of the land on which we are based. We acknowledge that the land that we at Tufts University are gathered on is home to the Massachusetts and Wampanoag people. Thriving indigenous communities existed on this land before European settlers came and waged campaigns of genocide against them. As part of this meeting, we commit to going further than merely naming these injustices. We encourage everyone gathered here to recognize the land you are on and the history associated with it. We urge you all to support local indigenous agendas and work with indigenous peoples, centering their voices in the fight for just sustainable futures. And with that, we will now introduce our two moderators, Chelsea Way and Brie McGowan. Chelsea is a first year studying international relations and cognitive and brain sciences. She is a member of the awareness team for Women's Higher Education Now Tufts chapter. Brie McGon is a junior studying international relations and economics and minoring in Arabic, and she is a, woman, a member of Women in International Relations. All right, Chelsea and Brie, take it away. All right, I guess we could start by starting off with the basic introduction question. Please introduce yourselves and tell us a bit about what you do for a living. Um, we could start with Professor um, Schildkraut and then Ms. Feldutra Santos, Ms. Yoon, and then Professor Larson. Great. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me and welcome to everyone who's with us today. Uh, so my name is Debbie Schilkraut. I'm a professor in the political science department. I'm also currently the chair of the political science department. My research focuses on politics in the United States, particularly with respect to public opinion on issues related to identity, race, ethnicity, and immigration. Uh, I'm also a mother to two school-age kids who are going to school um, in the house where I am right now. So I apologize in advance if we have any guest visitors today. Should I just go ahead, Chelsea? Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, hi. So uh, my name is Agnieszka Faldo Trasantas. I'm a pro uh, director of programs at the Global Network of Women Peacebuilders. And the Global Network of Women Peacebuilders were a coalition 
of uh, more than 100 organizations, women's rights organizations and women-led uh, peace building organizations in about 50 countries, most of them affected by conflict. So a lot of our work focuses around um, well, around this UN agenda that's called Women, Peace and Security Agenda, but more practically around making sure that women are meaningfully uh, represented, they meaningfully participate in uh, peace processes, that means both negotiations of, uh, you know, uh, peace negotiations and the implementation of peace agreements and everything that happens after the peace agreement is signed, as well as sort of more informal processes, mediation and, and building trust and social cohesion on the ground. Um, and yeah, that, that has, of course, a lot of components, which I'll, I'll be happy to speak about later. But um, thank you very much for having me. And I look forward to the discussion. Awesome. Miss Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hila Yoon. Uh, I'm the founder of Afghan Youth Ambassadors for Peace Organization. And I'm, I grew up in Afghanistan, but I'm currently based in the UK. I'm doing my master's in international finance and trade. And previously, I work with Agnashka, the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. So she already told you what we do um, in the in JNWP. But in Afghanistan, I work with young women and also uh, with youth, uh, how to prevent violent extremism in Afghanistan and how to advocate for women meaningful participation in the current peace process with the Taliban that is happening in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thanks, Hila. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Anna Larson, and I am currently teaching in the political science department at Tufts. Uh, I teach a couple of courses this semester uh, in fragile states, the politics of fragile states, and also um, issues in democratization. Uh, but my courses in the fall were perhaps more directly relevant to this uh, panel, and those are on gender and international relations. Um, so I come from SOAS. Uh, I was teaching at SOAS in London, the University of London, before teaching in uh, over here. And uh, before that, have been working in and on Afghanistan for about 15 years, so since 2004. So I'm particularly excited to um, to see Hila here. Um, Salam alaikum, Hila. It's really nice to see you and um, and to hear what you have to say. Um, you know about your experiences uh, in Afghanistan, a country that is very close to my heart and to my current research, which focuses on um, women in politics in Afghanistan and also the peace process, but also democratization um, and political parties in Afghanistan. So a mixture of things. Um, but it's it's a great pleasure to be here, so thank you for asking me. Great, thank you so much for introducing yourselves. We're so glad that you are all here. Uh, I'll start off by asking Professor Schildekraut, what is the role of gender in politics on the world stage? Yeah, so the, I saw that question, and that is a huge question. So I thought what might be helpful to answer in just two to three minutes is to uh, maybe summarize some of the things that are on my mind these days that relate to that question. Uh, one of them is just watching the news today in the Northeastern United States, focusing on the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, is someone that people had mentioned as possibly being interested in running for president. And it seems like now chances are more likely that he's going to resign based on his treatment of women in the workplace and the way he used his power to uh, to create workplaces that were hostile, outright hostile to women. Um, the story is unfolding pretty rapidly, but that's been dominating my attention today following this story, not just for you know what it means for American politics, what it means for discussions of women trying to achieve power and advance their careers in the way uh, that has been that has been been thwarted uh, women as as targets, the power dynamics in, in the workplace that really, um, you know, prevent so many women to have opportunities for for leadership. So um, so, you know, this this case in New York is just one example, but there are countless uh, countless of them. On the one hand, the fact that we have these discussions and that it, that at times men are held accountable for it is positive, but the fact that we keep having these discussions is, is clearly an ongoing problem. Lately, I've also been thinking a lot about emerging research on the role of women as leaders during the COVID pandemic and how there, whether or not there's variation in states that have women governors, cities that have women mayors, countries that have women leaders, and do they, do, do they, um, weather the pandemic differently than, than other countries and to what extent is the fact that there are women at the helm um, related to that. I don't think we fully know the answer to that question, but I think it's a really timely, uh, interesting research question that I'm paying attention to. 
And then thinking about all the events uh, of the past year, um, and actually the whole during, during the whole Trump presidency, um, thinking about women as leaders of movements, about women leading the racial justice movement, women's leadership in the environmental movement, women's leadership in movements against gun violence and for increased gun regulation, um, women leading these movements as women, but also women leading these movements in their role as mothers is something that's been really um, important to me to, to watch and, and take stock of how much they've been able um, to, to accomplish under exceptionally challenging circumstances. So those are the things that, that I've been thinking a lot about lately. Thank you so much, Professor Shokrow. This one is for you, Ms. Saldita Santos. As a woman in the cause and as the director of programs for Global Network of Women Peace Builders, could you tell us a bit about it and some of the most recent initiatives that you have been working on? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I'll maybe sketch out the general way that we that we work at GNWP and, and, and maybe put in some examples to concretize that. Uh, and the general way that we work, that all of our sort of strategies are encapsulated in, is um, going, you know, we say it's like a, a global to local and local to global model. So I told you at the beginning that we work with United Nations um, Security Council resolutions on women, peace and security. As you I'm sure know, United Nations Security Council is one of the sort of most powerful bodies right within that global infrastructure within the sort of multilateral system of multilateral institutions so it was really really significant more than 20 years ago now when that body um, that has you know historically before that only uh, addressed women women's leadership or even women's needs very tangentially and always from the perspective of victims that it recognized that 20 years ago in that first resolution that women are actually have actually critical roles to to build in um sorry to play in building and sustaining peace uh since then we've had nine more resolutions we now have 10 and uh this has become something that's much more accepted at the global stage uh although we are facing a backlash over the last you know few years as we see sort of across uh, the spectrum of, of, of uh, work for gender equality and women's rights, so too in that area of women specifically in peace and security. Um, which, by the way, goes hand in hand with the backlash against the broader multilateralism and the crisis that multilateral institutions are um, finding themselves in. So just adding to what um, Professor Schildkraut said uh, just now, I think that's an interesting question too, of looking at sort of how multilateral institutions have supported and feminists and feminist movements have been able to leverage them to advance some of these agendas and, and the adoption of the resolution 1325 is, is fruit of such leveraging of those multilateral institutions and how now the backlash against, you know, uh, against feminists, against gender uh, rights, this sort of outright right wing um, rise of, of uh, those movements uh, has, you know, the, the, the backlash against feminism has sort of provided a fertile ground to also, um, or a common ground for a lot of these movements and, and, and has therefore bolstered sort of the most yeah, anti multilateralism nationalistic narratives. Uh, but going back to your question, so what we do is that bringing these resolutions, because it's very significant that they were passed and they are there, uh, it's very significant at the global level. And it's significant because they actually came from grassroots organizing and from women activists. It was women civil society who drafted the first draft of that resolution 1325, who advocated for it since Beijing, since the Hague conference, um, in 1999 so it has been you know a long time coming really from the women's movement to the security council and what we want to ensure is that that is then transferred uh you know, actually implemented in those communities where these women work on a daily basis. So what we do for that is one of our flagship initiatives, I'll tell you about two. Uh, one of them is uh, called localization of women, peace and security. And that's really where we work with uh, local authorities. So whether it's governors or mayors or, um, uh, you know, council or local council members or traditional leaders or religious leaders in countries where they play significant role and have significant decision making um, 
impact over decision making and bring them together with local women, uh, women activists, women peace builders, women teachers, women from the community uh, to first analyze together these international laws that, you know, don't, don't immediately resonate very strongly in local communities, right, to analyze them, analyze their context and their needs and see how that matches up. And we then support a policy development process wherein these actors, both the sort of decision makers, the authorities, whether they're male or female, and and the um or gender non-conforming uh, and the um and the you know women and other actors from the community uh develop either a local action plan for the implementation of these policies in a way that makes sense given the local reality or they integrate they, they design provisions to integrate it into um existing local uh, policies. And the um, second flagship program, like I said, is one that uh, we are also initiating in Afghanistan with uh, HILA and her organization, Afghan Women's Welfare and Development um, um, Association, which is Young Women Leaders for Peace. And that's why we work with young women, usually young women who already know uh, how to read and write. That's That shouldn't be a privilege, but in some contexts it is. And we train them, we have like a comprehensive training module, it, it usually takes place as a series of what we call trainings of trainers. And it's adapted to every context because not every context has the same needs, but the broad components are, you know, leadership, peace building, but then also literacy. And like I said, they are not learning to read and write, they're learning how to teach others. And for example, in um, Bangladesh and Cox's Bazaar, the Bangladeshi young women are now teaching Rohingya refugee women who don't have access often to sort of gender responsive and age appropriate education, right? Education is there only for small children in the camps. Uh, the Bangladeshi women are, are teaching the refugee women how to read and write, which really makes a huge difference in terms of them being able to find distribution points for food, for aid, uh, being able to read documents and sign documents, even just sign their name, even if, if it's very basic skill. So uh, yeah, literacy and then the use of communications. So whether it's again, community radios or theater skits or social media, depending on the context and what um, is the most useful. And the young women, the program is now active in, I think nearly 10 countries. And we're going to reach and exceed 10 this year. Um, and in all of these countries, we are in contact with these young women. And after this series of trainings, they sort of like take it away. They design their own initiatives and we provide both technical and financial support for them to be able to or to implement their own initiatives, whether it's a series of peace dialogues in their communities, uh, whether it's a social media campaign, whether it's a series of literacy classes, whether it's a series of, you know, um, community radio broadcasts, etc. Uh, so, so these are two things that we do. And I'll just say one more sentence because I know I'm, I'm being very liberal with my time allocation uh, that the other crucial part is then the local to global so you know through research and then evidence-based advocacy uh, and through creating spaces for our partners, women from around the world, to directly speak to policymakers, we want to make sure that it's not just us bringing these global policies to the women, but they that our partners from all across the world have opportunities to also feed into new policies that are being developed, new strategies, action plans, etc., as well as resolutions at the UN level. So there are the two directions, uh, and I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a really thoughtful response. Um, so Ms. Yoon, we wanna know what pushbacks have you experienced as the CEO of the Afghan Welfare and Development Association? Um, and how have you addressed these challenges? Um, thank you. Uh, when we started this organization, our whole focus was to focus on grassroots level, um, young women peace builders at the local level, not just the capital. Um, so when we started working in the local areas, one of the, we have, I will just categorize the pushbacks that we uh, face so far and what cha or what we have done to address these challenges. Um, I think one of the biggest challenge or the pushback that we have faced, uh, and this is the current problem uh, also of a lot of young female activists in Afghanistan is security. A lot of young women in Afghanistan don't have security and currently there have been so many assassination and target killing going on in Afghanistan and so many young women are have, ma have been killed. Um, I'm from a province called Lingarhar and, and just in last week uh, four young women activists have been killed uh, and, uh, and have been killed by unknown 
gunmen. So this is one of the problems that a lot of young women, um, especially if they're working at the local level and addressing very sensitive issues, faces. And that's the same thing that we have faced. Um, the second issue that uh, pushback that we have faced is lack of funding. A lot of grassroots level civil society organizations, especially if they are led by young women in Afghanistan, we don't receive that much support and that much funding opportunities that other organizations which have a, like, a long history of um, funds that they have received and uh, they and mostly which are based on in the capital, they're the one who receive a lot of funding. But our organization, organizations like us, which work mainly at the grassroots level, at the local level, we don't receive this much funding. And without funding, a lot of our activities cannot be implemented effectively at the local level because it needs a lot of resources and it needs a lot of funding opportunities as well. Um, the third um, uh, pushback that we uh, often face is the lack of political will, both from the government side and also from the local community and local government institute and international communities as well. We have so many uh, good uh, laws in Afghanistan related to women. The problem is it's never implemented and it's never localized. Women living in the capital, they know what their law is. They have some privileges. But when you go to these local areas in Afghanistan, when you see these local young women what they have been facing we see that there is no law the government do not have the capacity or not willing to implement those uh, law related to women in this uh, at local level and we have a lot of international uh, resolutions such as like UNSCR 1325 or 2250 which mainly focus on youth uh, the women peace and security agenda and YPS agenda but in Afghanistan a lot of Many local women, many young activists don't even know what these resolutions are, which are very important for them if they want to participate in all decision making processes in Afghanistan, but also around the world. So this is one of the thing lack of political will from the government side and from the international communities is also one of the biggest pushback for young activists such as like us that are active in Afghanistan. Um, these are the problems that we face in Afghanistan many times, but how we address is that we still put our efforts, most of our work is voluntary based. Uh, a lot of young uh, women from the local um, areas in Afghanistan, they actually volunteer to work with us. And sometimes even though we don't have the funding for, uh, for them to support them, we still try to amplify their voices at the le local level, national level and international level. But we, uh, how, uh, but also we receive support from organizations such as like GNWP, just like Agnieszka said, that they have been supporting young women um, organization at the local level. And that's how we receive a lot of our supports from such organization. And previously I did work with GNWP as the core OS Peace Building Fellow and all of this experience that I have learned um, while working in New York, while working with GNWP, is how we can amplify the voices of young women peace builders at the local level. And this is the experience that I have taken from the New York and now that I'm working in Afghanistan and I'm implementing that knowledge that I have and I'm trying to find ways um, to how can we amplify the voices of young peace builders, especially young women in Afghanistan, and how we can um, uh, pave the way for them to participate in all decision-making processes in Afghanistan. It's a very di it's very difficult because if you want to bring social change um, in such countries, it's it takes a lot of time. And our whole agenda is, and our whole goal is, if we want to build sustainable peace, if we want to bring sustainable peace in countries such as Afghanistan, it's by empowering young women at the local level. We need to br uh, build peace at the local level. We need to uh, make agents of change at the local level. And that's how we can ma bring a sustainable peace um, in Afghanistan and in countries like others as well. Um, so so that's all I want to say um, right now. But I can s talk about our organization in further details as well later on. Thank you, Ms. June. So the, ne so the next question is for both Professor Larson and Ms. Hume. As both of you have had experiences in working in Afghanistan, especially Ms. Hume, what have been the most significant advancements in women's peace building efforts in Afghanistan? Ms. Hume, do you want to start us off first? Um, I think one of the biggest significance that we have seen so far, if we look at the current peace process, although we see that a lot of young women are so, still not visible at the negotiation team, uh, but we still have strong women negotiator, uh, which support, uh, which receive support from a lot of international community and UN member states and from different organizations and from different women movements. 
and this is one of the um, biggest um, achievement that we have um, seen so far in Afghanistan that we, right now we are currently in the current peace process with the Taliban and a lot of women in Afghanistan are not backing up they're not sacrificing themselves anymore they're, what they have achieved so far and in the last 20 years they're still fighting for that and they're not giving up and this is something that we need to support because if we don't we don't we will not have that sustainable peace in Afghanistan um, or in other country or countries like this. So this is one of the, s I think, f um, um, in my point of view, one of the biggest uh, achievement and uh, significance that we have seen in Afghanistan so far. But there are other achievements that we have seen in other sectors and other industries in Afghanistan. If we look at the police uh, academy or uh, the, the, the police force in Afghanistan, we see higher rate and higher percentage of women going to p um, joining the police forces. And it was not possible like 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. We see higher um, uh, rate uh, a young women going to schools uh, still uh, with current with the COVID-19 pandemic a lot of young women have been impacted by the COVID-19 but still young women are now joining uh, joining uh, and pursuing higher education in Afghanistan and women we can see the uh, political participation of young women in the political processes and in political sectors as well recently and it was not visible in the last 20 or 30 years and I think women presence in these uh, key political um, positions I think this is one of the significance that a lot uh, that we have achieved so far in Afghanistan thank you so much for um, the opportunity to contribute uh, to this discussion I, I absolutely defer to Hila and her um, superior knowledge and experience obviously on this this subject um, but just a few contributions as well, drawing from um, Afghan women and men that, I, that I've talked to over, over the years, which essentially echo exactly what, what Hilo is saying. Um, this, this focus on the local level is so important and so often overlooked. And I think um, having had the privilege to speak to people, for example, in Herat province in Western Afghanistan, uh, women running peace building initiatives through a midwifery program. You know, through, through programs that already exist where women have access into homes at the local level and then can talk to families, can talk to people about what their sons are doing and, you know, how to influence um, the young boys, particularly in their, in their communities. So some really innovative initiatives um, that are being uh, put forward by extremely brave and extremely uh, courageous people at the local level. Um, so I think Keila is absolutely right to, to highlight that as, as something so important and significant. Um, just to contrast that with the, the national level, um, as Hila mentioned, you have uh, four women who are on the negotiating team with the Taliban now out of a total 21. And those four women are, um, you know, they are passionately uh, devoted to promoting women's rights at this national and international level. Three of them are um, very famous in their own right um, in terms of their backgrounds, you know, related to the king and uh, so former king and, um, you know, have these big political connections. But one I'd like to highlight, um, Sharifa Zomati uh, is a local woman from uh, <laughs> she's from um, from Wardak province of Pakhtia. She was an MP for Pakhtia province, Wardak uh, area of Afghanistan. And I interviewed her a few times for uh, my book a while ago when she was an MP. And she talked very much about her emphasis on service provision and how she had this local connection with her community. And the, she thought that the reason that she'd been voted into office was because of that commitment to bringing central resources back to her community, uh, which was echoed uh, also as a, as a kind of general practice from MPs in other places too. But she developed this reputation for caring for her community and for providing for her community. And her political career has just you know, accelerated since then. But I was really pleased to see that she had um, achieved this position of, of prominence and, and influence on the Peace Council because of that local connection that she has and because she's a bit different to the sort of more standard um, stories of, of, of women already in positions of authority, you know, gaining those, those positions. But one other thing I'd just like to mention, and that is just that women in Afghanistan have had so many uh, adverse conditions to overcome over the years. And in 2003, it was women who were standing up in the constitutional lawyer Jirga tent, telling 
the world that warlords should not be there. And it was women who were standing up then at that time because they had been the ones who were organizing underground schools under the Taliban and you know, mobilizing at that point under the Taliban. And then before that, under the Mujahideen era too, which was just as conservative in many ways and just as damaging for women. But the internationals weren't so interested in helping out at that point. So I do believe there is a real history of women's activism and involvement that stems back many years that shouldn't be forgotten in this focus on the international period of assistance between 2001 and 2020. Thank you both. Next, we have a question for Professor Schulderkraut. Has there been an impact on gender discourse following Kamala Harris's vice pre presidential win? So I think it may be a little too soon to answer this question. I guarantee you that people are going to be researching <laughs> that and 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 what it what impact it may have on on how people feel about future candidates for for the presidency and the vice president. I will say that there is some research on the role of women candidates as role models for girls. And this research seems to suggest that, as you would expect, it really is important and that girls are more likely to see that there's a place for them in politics if they see women running for office. So not just at the level of vice president, but you know, running for local government, serving in local office in the state house, seeing women in positions of power in electoral politics matters for girls and thinking that this is something that they may that they might want to do someday and in the type of imagery that comes to mind when you ask them you know what do you think of when you see think of a president and what do you think of when you think of a politician there's some new research coming out where uh, a group of scholars went into elementary schools and asked kids to draw these pictures and they you know analyze them and and as girls got older they became more likely to think that it was men who would run for office that the kind of idea that this is for me is something that that goes away as girls get older uh, but that it can be help really helpful for seeing women in office. Um, I think the fact that we, you know, haven't really been talking that much about the fact that we have a woman vice president could be interpreted as a good thing. It's just maybe not a big deal. I think part of that is that maybe for many Americans, it just seems normal now after having someone like Hillary Clinton achieve as much as she did in her in her run for the presidency, uh, that, that it just may seem less groundbreaking to some people because it's just has this feeling of inevitability, perhaps. Uh, I think part of it, what the reason why it's hard to know for sure is also because of the contrast with the previous administration, where there was a new story and a new scandal every day. And it was so hard to keep up with it that our current administration is just so under the radar in how they're doing stuff. So that con and and I think part of that probably would have happened anyway with the Biden administration, but part of it I think is a concerted effort to have a contrast with the previous administration, and so this under the radar ness mutes a lot of things, including our discussions of hey we have the first female vice president. It's just we're just not talking about them very much. Um, which again could be interpreted as as a good thing. I will say though, I was struck by uh, a few days ago the Biden um, the Biden administration tweeted out a picture with um, so, some generals that Biden is nominating for to be four star generals, and Kamala Harris was in the picture. Um, and, and you all should Google it and look it up in the picture. So there's a picture, and then the the tweet that went along with it said. I want every child to know that this is what vice presidents and generals in the United States Armed Forces look like. Uh, and you know that's messaging that is new and we can only imagine that it will matter. It'll take a while till we have empirical studies that can actually document this fact. Um, but just the fact that it's being said is, is noteworthy. Uh, and what also drew my attention to that tweet is, is when he, he wrote, not I want every girl to know, but I want every child to know that this is what vice presidents and generals look like. Because while it's important for girls to see women leaders, it's important for boys to see women leaders uh, and to talk with boys about it too. Uh, so, so I was really struck by, um, by the wording in that tweet. And, and this question also made me think of when, when Elizabeth Warren was in the primaries. And one important thing she made sure to do was when she was, you know, she was famous for her long selfie lines and giving everybody who was in attendance a chance to get a picture with her and to talk with her. And that when every, and whenever somebody came up with a young girl, she got down at eye level with the child and said, I'm running for president because this is what girls do. Uh, and so I think the, the question that you posed to me is, is it's important 
important, you know, I don't want to undersell that we have a woman vice president, but it's important that there are lots of women doing these things and having these conversations. And, and really, I think the impact is on, will be on the youngest generation who for them, this is normal to see women doing, uh, women doing these things. Thank you for your insight, Professor Sheldekraut. Now we're moving on to um, the general questions that we have that we provided for all of you. So feel free to unmute yourselves if you want to uh, add your input to this. But the first question is, what are some of the major barriers faced by women around the world in terms of access to politics and education? I mean, I, I can go first if there's uh, no takers and uh, yeah that's a huge question and unfortunately there are still so so many barriers and Hila spoke about some of them already right because she talked about uh, the um, she talked about the the threats right the attacks that women and girls face on a daily basis and that you know applies to uh, girls not going to schools and when there is armed conflict uh, you know families are or uh, yeah, are more likely to sort of stop sending their girls to schools before they they stop sending their boys to schools, right? And there is a myriad of reasons for that, and it might be linked to uh, you know prioritizing resources. Unfortunately, when you have limited resources, again, in many societies and most likely my my own country, Poland included, you know, you'll you'll sort of prioritize investing in your sons getting education first, uh, but also the security, right? So there is this, but an, an important aspect. Uh, in terms of access to politics and something that has been on the rise is the attacks on um, women politicians, women activists, uh, women who are active in the public sphere. Um, in 2019, um, I believe um, um, ACLET, which is the, the a database of various violent events for the first time did that sort of, uh, you know, uh, accounting, I guess, of the number of political violence incidents against women. Uh, and uh, so, and, and, and so they compared that to, to the data that, that uh, so they compared data from, from a couple of years prior as well. And, uh, noted that it's on the rise and in 2019 it was in fact the peak right it was the highest level of political violence against women ever recorded and i haven't seen the data for 2020 yet but we already know from the accounts that, that it has been increasing we know that in colombia it has been increasing from our partners we know that in Afghanistan it has been increasing so i wouldn't you know i would very much expect that the trend is still going up and uh, you know in the democratic republic of the congo our partners have been monitoring um voting stations during the election elections in 2018. And what they noted is that uh, there were attacks at voting stations, right? And they might be verbal harassment or they might be, you know, physical harassment of people being, uh, you know, hooted at or, or beaten up, etc. And that majority of those assaulted at voting stations were women. Right, whether it's a verbal assault or physical assault. So that's another barrier for women to participate politically, even as voters. Uh, so the, the violence against women and politically motivated violence against women is a serious barrier. And, and of course, you know, the the a lot of it also just takes the form of, of murders, right? Of, of women activists, women peace builders and human rights defenders around the world. So uh, that's one. And the second one, which I'll just mention, I won't talk about to give others a chance to speak, but it is the funding. Uh, and when we speak to women political candidates, we've worked with women uh, can, uh, political candidates in several countries. They tell us, you know, we don't need another training on public speaking. We're good. We're excellent public speakers, right? But like everyone comes in and they're like, well, train you on public speaker. What we need is money because we need like it costs money to run a campaign uh, we need access to the media and you often have to pay for the access to the media we need you know platforms to be able to use these public uh, speaking skills that we we have heard so well so uh the funding barriers and that means you know of course the 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 costliness of um colombian uh sorry of uh political races and i said colombian because we have a very close par partner and friend from colombia who's an excellent you know woman human rights defender and activist and peace builder and who ran for for an office in her local area but she just couldn't afford to keep the campaign going uh so so both 
that aspect of funding, but then like of funding for women run organizations, you know, that could um, sort of support the civic education support at the various stages support help break down some of these barriers on the way there. That's a chronic chronic issue too, and we see so many of our partners struggling with it. So I'd say these are two big ones. Maybe I can just um, follow up on that uh, point because I have a, a sort of similar complementary um, observation to make, and that is not so much about the physical violence, but about the structural violence that prevents women from uh, taking part in politics in Afghanistan. And I'll speak specifically to Afghanistan um, because that's sort of where my research focus is. Um, but I was privileged to take part in a research project for the Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit and UN Women last year. And the focus was on women's political participation and you know, what uh, was enabling it and what would be sort of ways to bolster it potentially in light of uh, a Taliban um, sort of a power sharing arrangement. Uh, and what we found was actually that um, people talk, women talk specifically about reputation as a real barrier, because if you put yourself forward as a political candidate, you subject yourself to public scrutiny, but also to the slurs, the political slurs uh, from other uh, rival candidates, not least other women, in fact, who, you know, will go to measures to uh, derail your campaign as a, as, a, uh, as a political candidate. And it's so easy to do that when, uh, as a woman, your honor, your reputation is tied up in sort of the public face that you put forward. And any kind of slur to do with sort of whether you're in a public place with a man you're not related to, or, you know, anything like that, very small, small thing can absolutely, uh, A, to destroy a political career, but also not much, much more importantly than that really, can have a huge impact on, as an individual, your likelihood of getting married in the future, and also at, at, on your family and your family's social status. And so there are huge barriers to putting yourself out there politically and risking that because of this potentially long-term effect not only on your on yourself as an individual, but on, on your family as well. And I, I feel that that is really overlooked. I think it's very important to focus on this, the physical threats and the bombings and the, um, you know, the, the targeted attacks on women, um, but also on, you know, this, this real barrier, which is a social one, essentially, and one that takes very, very strong, committed family, husband, father support. To overcome. So one of our findings from the research was if you want to support women in their political careers in Afghanistan, their political participation, you need to, to look at their families as well. You know, you, you need to support them as part of a community rather than as individuals. Great. I can move on to the next question. This is another question for everyone. Uh, what has been your experience as a as women in international relations or political science, given that these are traditionally male dominated fields? So I can speak briefly. I've actually been really fortunate in my experience in political science to have always had really supportive mentors. And my research is in an area that I think has been generally very welcoming to women scholars. I know stories from lots of other women in political science and in international relations in particular, uh, who study things like international security, who study political violence and are told in not so many words or in so many words, what's a nice girl like you doing studying bombs and war? Shouldn't you be studying something else? That actually has never really happened to me. But being in academia, I have experienced some things that I imagine are not unique to academia, but I just want to put this out there because chances are people who are joining us today may experience some version of this, which is as you are younger and earlier in your career to maybe be warned about other women who are more senior to you. So this has happened to me on many occasions where I'll be put on a committee or I'm going in an environment where the chair of a committee or something is this more senior woman in the field. Um, and other people come to me, oh, you have to work with her. <laughs> She's difficult. Uh, be careful around her. And in my experience, 
pretty much 100% of the time that woman that I'm warned about turns out to be wonderful and incredible. <laughs> and I have learned over the years when someone warns me about another woman to think I want to get to know her and I want to learn her ways because she doesn't take anything from anybody. She usually has high standards. She usually knows how to speak her mind and get things done. And I want to be more like her. So I, um, that's been a very common experience in the workplace actually. So, uh, and I imagine again, that it's not unique to, to academia. So if you do ever hear this about women um, that you have to work with who are more senior, um, consider it as a, as a beacon <laughs> to go towards the light rather than running away. That's Ms. Yoon. Um, I want to answer this question because before I started my own civil society organization, um, I used to work with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Afghanistan. I worked there for one year, one year and what I have noticed a lot that we don't have many female diplomats um, abroad as well. And this is one of the challenges that Afghan women actually face. We don't see much representative uh, representation of female um, in, in international politics as well. We do have uh, female um, ambassadors uh, like in the UN and in other countries, but only like three or four and the rest of the countries, the ambassadors are always male. Um, and also when I was working in the ministry, I see that a lot of opportunities were given to male uh, junior diplomats, but not so many for female uh, junior diplomats who newly joined the foreign services. And actually one of the obstacle was the lack of government funding and opportunities for such um, junior diplomats as well, but also a lot of female diplomats and even those girls who newly joined the foreign services, they were also afraid to travel alone and to travel alone to other countries and actually um, increase their public speaking skill as well. So this is uh, related to barriers that Anna uh, already mentioned that why a lot of women, especially in Afghanistan, don't pursue political career in Afghanistan, but there are other barriers as well um, to this. Even when I was working with the ministry, we had a lot of, we had many departments and most of the time uh, only one of the department had a female head and uh, many other departments, which is very strategic, which was related to economic trade with regional trades with other countries, whether it was UN or whether it was very uh, key important departments, most of the time the head was a male, not female. So this is the problem that a lot of young and a lot of uh, women face in international politics and at the international level. Uh, and this is that I'm speaking just from experience from Afghanistan. And I'm sure that in other countries we see positive re uh, representative representation of young um, women and men and women um, at the international politics, but not so much in countries like Afghanistan and less developed countries. a quick one on this one. I mean, I find myself in rooms full of men quite often um, in terms of, um, I don't know, meetings about Afghanistan, just because it's usually these meetings, whether it's, you know, the, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, in the UK or, you know, the sort of big um, strategic uh, ministry level meetings are usually security focused. So it's normally about sort of security funding. So in those sectors, it's normally quite a lot of um, a lot of men, but I haven't normally had any problems. They've been very, um, it, like like um, Professor Shilkraut said, you know, it's, it's not been too, um, too much of a, a problem. Um, but I guess one thing I would say is just, it seems uh, just interesting how, um, I get referred to in professional contexts as Ms. rather than doctor, you know, quite a lot. And it's just like, I don't see men of the same sort of, sort of career level having that issue. And it's, it's quite funny, even on one occasion when a, a civil servant was um, introducing me to Boris Johnson at a reception one time and I had to correct him. <laughs> um, he wasn't the prime minister at that point, but still, um, <laughs> it just, uh, you know, there are there are times when you really have to fight for um, things that should be just normal. Like I worked the same amount of time for my PhD as, you know, any male colleague you know, the same university, and yet uh, it seems like there's a reluctance to use that uh, title sometimes. But, um, and it's not that I want to use, like, it's not that I'm bothered by, you know, not using it. It's just that comparison seems a, a little um, stark sometimes. 
and maybe for a quick uh, a very quick uh, note building on uh on the the point about sort of the security rooms being full of uh men which is of course true but it's interesting so what i was going to say well we see a lot of uh, a lot in our work and you know my work is sort of explicitly linked to you know gender equality women's participation quote unquote women's issues right and what we tend to see it's 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 either one or the other so on on the one hand um women tend to be very much sort of like siloed or relegated if they're in the government or in the ministry of social policy and family and health maybe uh but not in the ministry of finance right not in the ministry of defense uh those quote unquote and hard issues are seen as the male male issues and and that's why I just wanted to mention how significant that is and how uh, interesting to watch that the appointment uh, appointment of Ngozi Okonje Waala as the head of World Trade Organization as the first woman and the first African to head the organization so uh, let's keep fingers crossed for that but there is that siloization but it also happens the other way around often if we organize an event and we say it's about women peace and security and we invite a governor right who is a man of course uh then they will send their you know female employee which is we want that woman there. We want many women there, but we also want men there. We want men to care about these issues, but it does very much seem like the public life, the politics is divided up. There's, there are the women's issues and women are, you know, relegated and limited only to those. And then the men don't tend to care about those as much. So yeah, that's 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 just an unfortunate dynamic. Oh, and I just want to say, and that also goes for young women. And that's something we see in sort of our work with international organizations when we get you know asked to recommend people for panels. And, and I'm always very adamant about saying the young women we work with, they don't only have to be speakers on panels about youth. They have expertise on things that are not their identity, right? Women have expertise on things that are not our identity. We, you know, we have thematic expertise. So yeah. Thank you all for your responses. Now we are going on to the last question. For the past 30 minutes, we've been talking about the past very often, but this question, we're asking you, what changes would you like to see for women involved in international politics in the future? So I can go first and just be super brief and say one thing we're advocating for is all these processes uh, should have meaningful participation of women. And the definition of meaningful is, of course, a whole other can of worms. So I won't open it since I said I'll be brief. Uh, but it should no longer be uh, acceptable to have a peace negotiation where women are not on the, at the table. And I'm saying at the table, I think it's, it doesn't cut it to have, you know, just an advisory board. Women, uh, board women have to be part of the actual negotiating teams. And we're, we're calling on the UN to make it a requirement for all peace processes that they support. I can go next briefly. My my research is in, in the area of international politics, but um, but I think that what I'll say applies probably as well. But um, and this this builds off the point that was made earlier about women being relegated to some issues and and men being relegated to to other issues. But is is recognizing and having policies that support families uh, and particularly thinking about everything that has happened during the past year during the pandemic and the the disproportionate challenges that women as caregivers um, has have faced and in finding ways to support caregiving uh, which is a women's issue but need not be a women's issue uh, over time uh, but and having having um, the interest and dedication to to supporting um, supporting families, not just so that families have the support that they need, but that also then creates opportunities for women to do all of the things that they want to do in international politics. Ms. Yoon? Um, I just want to briefly address this question is that most of the time when we talk about international politics and women role in international politics, women are often seen as victims and a lot of time when these international politics happen, whether it's related to um, security issues, they say that women are not involved in the war, so we, there's no need for them to actually be involved in the peace processes at the international level or the peace agreement or the peace agreement implementation. So that's one of the important factors that we should consider that women are not victims 
agents. They're actually um, agents of change in their own community, and they have been um, building peace in their communities on, in different forms at the different levels. So I think seeing women as victim is one of the biggest um, barrier that is we are still facing and I think addressing this issue and seeing women and recognizing their important role in international politics can be very vital and once these women are actually recognized for their work that they have done we can see a lot of positive changes because most of the time local women or women at the international level they usually see women who are working at the international level I've seen when Kamala Harris actually became the vice president and it had a huge impact in Afghanistan and everyone was so happy okay you know in the US they actually saw first um, female vice president and they were also happy they actually kind of gained hope that okay if they're gonna do something like that if this thi this thing happened in the US after so many years after so many decades this might be possible in Afghanistan or countries like Afghanistan as well so strong representations of women at the international level in such key positions are very important and I think addressing this uh, that women can gain uh, can get this position by their own hard work uh, it's, it's very important um, so th that's what I wanted to address um, at, this, at this moment. If I can just draw maybe on Hila's point and also Professor Schildkraut's point as well, just on these issues of um, women not being victims and also this family issues not being solely women's issues. Um, just, just thinking about feminism and how we can make changes in our approach to men, potentially, to um, make sure that our approach is a holistic one and one that impacts men as well, that helps men to change their perceptions of what women's issues are uh, and tries to maybe lessen the sort of the conflictual men versus women approach and actually sort of look at us at how, as how we interact with one another, how, what our gender relations mean, you know, in terms of power, in terms of influence, in terms of how we get on, uh, you know, as families and as, as communities. And I think is really important. And it might be a little controversial, but I, I really do think that that should be the direction that, that we're heading in, uh, less conflictual, hitting all men against all women, which emphasizes the victim status of women. Um, to, to do a more complicated intersectional understanding of gender and um, and of our different roles in different places uh, within you know our sort of uh, our society. All right, thank you everyone for your perspectives and all the insights that you've given us. So we only have one question in the audience Q&A. So we'll just ask you guys that and then wrap it up to respect everyone's time. But do you have any last advice for women or gender minorities looking to pursue a career in IR or political science? So I can go first. Um, you know, I think it's, it's easy for me to say get a mentor, <laughs> but uh, so it's easy to say, but I do think mentorship is really important. I know for sure I would not be here today if there wasn't somebody who took it upon himself to mentor me and suggest that this is a career that I should consider uh, and to open that door for me. Um, I was in a situation where this mentor sought me out as a student in class who said, I think this may be a career for you, let's talk about it. And then that person continued to support me. Uh, it's, it can be hard to find a mentor, but having that on your radar is a good first step to then, you know, in your classes, in internships that you have, keep an eye out for people who seem supportive, people who there's a phrase, um, that I think is helpful for thinking about this is a phrase called lift as you climb. So as somebody is advancing in their world, do they bring other people with them? And you can approach people and you know, it doesn't have to be this awkward, will you be my mentor kind of thing, but, but ask them for advice or learn about their story. How did you, you know, invite people for coffee? It's, it can be a little awkward to take that first step, but people, you know, may not be know that you're interested in that kind of guidance. Some people may not be comfortable offering unsolicited advice to you. So they may not know, know to approach you as as, as somebody that, that they have resources that can help you and guide you and let you know, oh, I've been there. I've, I've experienced what you're experiencing and this is how I took the path I took. Um, if those opportunities don't seem immediate to you, you can make those opportunities by looking out for people who seem supportive, generous with their time um, and simply just ask them questions about themselves and about their careers and, and take it from there.
maybe a complete different <laughs> advice, I guess, from a different side, but it's just um, the work for, you know, in the international relations world, I guess, arena, and especially for women because of the barriers we, uh, we face, but also because it's so intensely personal for many women who work in this, it can be very, very emotionally heavy. And so do not underappreciate, I guess, that emotional labor that goes into it. It's not entirely fair that it's there, but it's there. So I guess take care uh, of yourself, take time to take, uh, take care of yourself and of others. And if you're ever of in charge of creating a space where others have to be working and bear that in mind too, because there's so much burnout and so many, um, yeah, so so much, uh, like I said, emotional burden uh, in that in that sphere, and and women do bear it disproportionately, as in many other aspects of of life. All right, awesome. Thank you all, and we'd like to thank all our speakers one last time. Thank you so much for everything that you've added to our discussion. And thank you all attendees for coming and the Tufts Institute for Global Leadership is working on uploading the recording of this webinar to their YouTube channel if anyone wants to share it around or reference it later. So yeah, thank you everyone for being here with us today. It was amazing meeting all of you panelists and getting to talk to you and we totally appreciate all the work that you're doing. It's so important and meaningful and so inspirational for everyone in our clubs and everybody who was able to come today. So thank you. Thank you so much for organizing. This was a great discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.